Um, yes. Good, good. Now there, when she is revealed in the doorway, the Agamemnon and Cassandra, there is the net in which she trapped him and the bath in which he lay defenseless. I'll come back to those in a minute. So even in death, Agamemnon lies under Clytemnestra's control on her strategic threshold. And at the end of the play, she takes Aegisthus, her accomplice Aegisthus, in through that same door uh, into her house. So that's the two things I wanted to say about stage space, the, the use of the house and the use of the doorway. And now I'll move on to things. Um, stage furnishing props. And there are, I think, at least two scenes in the Oresteia that introduce a, a material embodiment that are outstanding among the most daring and integrated in the whole of world theatre. And I'm going to talk about one of them. The second one is, I think, I'll put it on one side for now, the trial scene in the third play, in Eumenides, where it's amazing that it actually sets up the entire paraphernalia, the entire setup for a, for a trial and a vote and the importance of voting, well, we know all too well from what has just gone on in the United States, the importance of voting, and you know all too well in Brazil, of course, uh, the importance of voting. Well, um, in Agamemnon, there's no, the, if you think, what did the skewer poios, the, 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 the stage manager, the designer, it was a kind of rolled into one, the stage manager, the, the designer, the uh, equipment, person, what did he have to do? He doesn't have to do anything until much in the Agamemnon, apart from masks and costumes, until the return of the king. It's almost as if he's is saving up for the amazing material that he's about to unveil. So when Agamemnon arrives, he's on a wagon of some sort. It's not actually a chariot. And with him is Cassandra, whether or not she was conspicuous. And that's wagon entries. Well, Skiropo has had to supply a wagon, but they're not unusual in early tragedy. What is going to be unusual is the act of stepping down from the wagon. After Agamemnon's made his first speech, from it's a, almost a kind of podium that he's standing on, raised up, Clytemnestra greets him at length, and she ends with these lines of instruction. <clears throat> I'm now quoting from my translation. And now, my dearest heart, step from this carriage, but do not, great king, set down upon the soil this foot which flattened Troy. Come, women, get on with your task of spreading fabrics all along the pathway he will walk. Yes, let us have a passage strewn with purple. Uh, he protests. Fancy, he doesn't want, he says, to step on fancy fabrics. That's very different from foot mats. But eventually, of course, he gives in. And after the token act of having his boots taken off, he's still unquiet about it. He says, I have deep qualms about destroying household properties by crushing underfoot these precious cloths that must have cost much silver coin. But he does it all the same. And slowly he makes his way from the wagon to the door and so to inside. Now this scene, the purple cloth scene, sometimes wrongly called the carpet scene, because it's not a very clearly not a carpet. Um, it's precious, delicate fabrics. Um, it's so familiar that it's not easy to recapture what an extraordinary stroke of theatre it must have been back in 458 at the first performance. It's unlikely that the audience had ever seen anything like it before. Theatre was still new. Theatre was only 50 years old. And a lavish pathway of purple cloth is laid out for several meters. We can't say exactly how far, but the vehicle probably came to rest somewhere near the center of the performance area. And from there to the door is a pathway. All the way to the door of the skinny building. And the mighty king steps down barefooted onto this pathway of cloth and walks slowly along its whole length. And meanwhile, his wife stands by and delivers a kind of enigmatic spell almost 
about the wealth of the house and how he brings coolness to it. The sea there is, she starts. And the sea, she says, produces an inexhaustible supply of welling purple. Whatever this means, we know it means Agamemnon's death. And in the song that the chorus sing immediately afterwards, they express deep forebodings about what they just witnessed. So all sorts of danger signals have been lit, uh, all sorts of red lights, and the audience is left free to think over them without much nudging. So let me signal some of them. The cloths are like a stream of blood flowing out from the house, an inexhaustible supply. Agamemnon is destroying household treasures. As you remember, he did with his daughter, his daughter Iphigenia at Aulis. She was a house, household treasure and he destroyed her. And this is a dangerously conspicuous display of wealth and then a waste of it. And that is a motif in the Agamemnon and in the whole trilogy, that to have too much wealth is dangerous, to destroy it um, is um, uh, an act of uh, arrogance. Um, above all, I feel the significance is that the man on the fabrics enacts Clytemnestra's victory. The all-powerful victor is disempowered. She doesn't even allow him to make direct contact with his native soil. You know, it's like he doesn't let her let him the, remember the gesture that you already have in the Odyssey of kissing the soil. He doesn't even touch the soil with his feet because she has laid this cloth down that prevents him from reclaiming his home ground. So the purple cloths are so much more than just a, an unusual prop. They form a luxurious track leading to Agamemnon's downfall. And the use of the fabrics and their color and their special spreading draw in a whole nexus of associations and images. I think it's the most amazing coup of theatrical genius, one of the greatest coup de théâtre, one of the greatest moments of theater in the whole of world theater. Now, um, I'm going to move on. Um, oh yes, I'm going to come to, to another use of cloth. Um, but when you think about stage properties, things in the tragic theater, I've read it said that the, the quintessential prop of tragedy is the sword. But actually, you know, I think the quintessential, if there is one, is the dead body. It's even more at the core of the tragic experience. Now, we're used to, we know that tragedies have dead bodies. But if you think of how striking that was in the very early days of theatre, to bring on, to be in the presence of the dead. And then, of course, you're not in the presence of the dead. At the end, the dead stand up and the play is over and they are applauded. Um, and you've been in the, ex you've had the experience of death without the death turning out to go on into the world outside. Um, and then cloth, fabric is a number three. So the sword, the dead body and fabric, clothing, binding, covering. So you've seen, um, we've seen that purple cloth scene um, and voluminous cloths and closely associated nets are worked into the Oristire again and again, especially in association with Clytemnestra. And then Cassandra again asserts her independence as we saw with the doorway she, she asserts her independence of Clytemnestra's machinations. She is wearing various accoutrements that mark her as a priestess of Apollo and as a prophet. And she has various things. It's not completely clear what they were like, but they included a staff, ribbons, and some kind of robe. And once she is foreseen that Clytemnestra is about to kill her, she renounces these as they brought her nothing except mockery. I quote, here's a quotation from Cassandra. What reason have I then to keep this token stuff? A joke against myself, this staff and ribbons round my neck. To hell with you, I pay you back like this. And see, Apollo for himself strips off this prophetic rigmarole. And so clearly, evidently what happens is she, whatever this kind of prophetic robe is, she throws it on the ground and she tramples on it. She says, 
to hell with you, I pay you back like this. Um, but unlike Agamemnon, when he treads on the purple cloth, she knows what she's doing when she treads on this cloth. And at the same time, she signals her scorn for Apollo. And for Apollo, you remember Apollo lusted for her and she refused him because she strips herself now and defies him. So once again, we see the integration of things, of props, of tangible things into the whole texture of the experience of the story into its physical and emotional texture. And then lastly, um, Cassandra is revealed, as we saw before, sword in hand with the two dead bodies. And here we have yet another tableau that has to be set in position by the skewerpoise. You see how much work there was for the skewerpoise. He had to supply all the cloths, he had to supply the wagons, he had to supply Cassandra's robes. Now he has to lay out two dead bodies, probably on this ecuclema, on this rollout machine, to be revealed with, Cassandra, with Clytemnestra, who's holding the sword. And she stands up for her deed and she's proud of the efficacy, of the uh, effectiveness, of a net-like cloth that she threw over Agamemnon to render him helpless. I cast around him an impenetrable mesh, like one for netting fish, a fatal luxury of fabric, a, 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 a pluton cacon, a hematos a plut, pluton cacon. And that phrase, more literally, an evil wealth, is so, so it strongly reminds you of the purple cloths that were laid out in Agamemnon's path. And some people have, some scholars have even held that the same stage prop was used for both, both for the purple cloth that he treads on and for the net that Clytemnestra throws over him. And that would make dramatic sense and it would also be helpful to the skewer poyos. But at the very least, the two fabrics must have been visually very similar. <clears throat> and it's absolutely clear that this net cloth is made visible as part of the tableau. And the chorus lament their king as he, he lies in what they call in this spider's web. And they repeatedly lament for the humiliation of Agamemnon's corpse, wrapped in this web and lying, they say, <coughs> lying in such a lowly bed, this bath with silver sides. So even the bath, it seems, was visible. <coughs> Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon with three stabs of the sword. But she couldn't have done that without first deceiving him and entangling him. And in the very last scene of the play, Gislas in the final scene is much more crude than her in his use of force. And he threatens the, the old men of the chorus with imprisonment and ill treatment. And the, the wrangle, the quarrel between them deteriorates to the point where he actually tells his bodyguard to grasp their swords at the ready. And the, the old men raise their feeble sticks in defense. So the very closing material symbols of the Agamemnon the transition to the second play that you've just been reading are the swords of Aegisthus' henchmen. Um, and they anticipate the new regime of the tyrant, the tyrant, the dictator, uh, the president who has, um, uh, who rules by force. And the sword is going to be, as you know, uh, very important in the, uh, in the next play. Uh, the sword that Orestes cuts his hair off at the very beginning of the second play, the sword which he eventually will kill uh, his mother, kill Clytemnestra with. <coughs> Excuse me. So there we are. Um, those were the things I was going to say. Um, and um, I will now bring back the screen and see you. Hello. I haven't been watching you. Uh, uh, fortunately, I haven't been watching your your gestures all the way through. Um, but um, there we are, half an hour. I've actually managed to stick to my time. And I very much welcome any questions, uh, anything that you would like to discuss. So please, please go ahead. Uh, will Will somebody um, look, be the chairman? Course, if you want to, I can work. As yes, a please chairman. do. So, so, so I don't have to look and see who. If people can raise their hands or put something in the chat or something, and then you, you, they, you, you can, you can be chairman. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, first, myself, I want to make, uh, I want to make a question. 
about the dead bodies. Yes. Uh, my, the thing is, by a moment the actor will, will will represent the dead body. He'll need to he'll need to walk there to put himself into position. Do you believe the Greeks had any kind of plan to hide him when he did that walk into the position where the dead body, where he will lie down as a dead body? Or no, do you think the Greeks didn't have a problem with that? Uh, well, I, th I think the, the arrangement of the tableau is indoors. So it's behind the scenes. So whether the bodies were, whether the dead bodies were represented by the actual actors who had played the parts, we don't know. Um, presumably not, because he only has three actors. And in the final scene, you have Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. So you can't have the ag actors of both Agamemnon and Cassandra being dead. Do you see what I mean? So they must have got somebody else <laughs> to act the dead bodies. So the dead bodies needn't be uh, actually the, uh, the, the, the same people who acted the parts. They need to look like them, but they don't need to be them. So I think that uh, in answer to your question, the arrangement of the dead bodies, the laying out of the bodies ready for the audience to see them is done indoors, out of sight. And then they, and then they are revealed. And it's the same in, same in Coifri. Um, uh, Orestes and, uh, and Pylades, they take Clytemnestra inside. Aegisthus has already gone inside. And then Orestes is revealed with the dead bodies of both uh, Clytemnestra and Aegisthus, but they've been, the, the tableau, you, you know what I mean by tableau? The tableau has been uh, arranged indoors. Do, do, is, does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Good, good. So that's, uh, that's the way I did. So I don't, think, uh, I don't think you see it. You don't see. Now, in a modern production, of course, you might see it. That's up to the, uh, the aesthetic of the production. Um, but I think in the Greek theatre, the arrangement of the dead bodies, you, um, you know, it's very, very rare in Greek tragedy for to have a death on stage. It happens very occasionally, but usually when you see a dead body, which is of, often, of course, in Greek tragedy, as indeed in post-classical uh, tragedy as well, as it is in Shakespeare or Racine or um, whoever, um, the, the, the dead body um, in the Greek theatre was laid out, uh, out of sight, and then either carried on or revealed? A good question, though, yes. Yeah, very well yeah. answered. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here from our professor. Yes. Uh, he, from Hemu. He's asking, who were the skilled... The skilled skilled boy, yes. Boy? And yeah. if they were artisans? Yes, I'm very. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because one of the things I'm I'm trying to write about in this thing I'm writing now is to to bring these important people to light. They're, they've they've been very neglected, and I think the reason they've been neglected is yes, because they're artisans, because you know they were de what the Greeks called dermi orgoi, people who who did work for the public, um, and they may have even been slaves. Um, and uh, so unlike the, the chorus had to be free citizens, the actors were, were well paid, uh, not necessarily citizens. Um, the, the Aulos player was a well paid free born person, though not necessarily from Athens, but we don't know who the Skiopoios was. Um, but two, there are two mentions, there are more than two, but there are two that I particularly remember, uh, which are interesting. One is in Aristophanes' play called The Knights, uh, one of the characters says uh, that the, the, the hated, uh, hated politician called Cleon is going to come on stage, but don't worry, it won't look as horrible as the real person because none of the skewer poyo were willing to make a mask for him. So, you know, they're, 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 they are mask makers. And then in, in Aristotle's Poetics, he actually says at one point, the, the visual side of tragedy is not really part of the poetry, part of the poetic uh, creativity. It's the job of the skewer poyos. 
So I think the reason why we hear so little about the Skiopoios is, is precisely because of the question you ask, precisely because he was an artisan, may have even been a slave. And our sources tend to be rather, uh, tend to be rather um, class conscious. Uh, they, they tend to uh, only be interested in uh, freeborn uh, citizens and to neglect uh, uh, artisans. So I think that's a very good point. Thank you. So, so we have some more questions. Uh, Julia Novais uh, asked, yeah. uh, what are the primary sources, textual and material, if any, for studying uh, tragic stagecraft, other than the tragedies themselves? Yes. Uh, so, Julia, hello. Yes, I can see you. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the plays themselves are the primary uh, evidence. And uh, as you saw in the talk I gave this to you just now, I, I uh, restricted myself almost entirely to the, to the text themselves. Um, there are external sources, um, and, but they're, they're, a lot of the external sources are late, uh, you know, are, come from hundreds of years later, and are very unreliable because the great age of Athenian tragedy was such a sort of golden time and people looked back on it in later antiquity, they looked back on it with such admiration and nostalgia that they made up lots of stories. So one can only really trust sources that are close in time. And that means above all comedy, uh, Aristophanes. Uh, Aristophanes and, you know, we have a lot of fragments of comedy as well. Um, and because comedy loves talking about theater. Comedy loves making jokes about theater and tra about tragedy just as much as, uh, as comedy itself. So there, that is our main external source apart from the, the plays themselves. Um, I have just been, because I've been writing about this, I've been using a very useful collection. I don't know whether it's easily available to you, um, but of the sources in translation, um, I'm just looking to remind myself what exact title. It's edited by Sharpo, Sharpo, C S A P O, and Slater. And it's called, excuse me. Um, it's called The Context of Ancient Drama. It was published by Ann Arbor Press, Michigan. Uh, press in 1995 and that's a very good collection of the sources but you're absolutely right that as you saw from my talk I was primarily using the text themselves and of course the text themselves uh, do not give factual information about how they were uh, performed you know you have to infer it my inference that the net and the bath were visible is <clears throat> because they are referred to with um, deictic pronouns. Do you understand what I mean by deictic? You know, it actually says this here. You know, in, in, in ancient Greek, um, they have three words for, for uh, deictics. Um, uh, hoda, which means this here. Hodi, which means this, that of yours, and a kenos, which means that over there. So when you get a hoda, this here, you know, it strongly implies that it's either there, uh, physically visible, or that it's very, very strongly um, evoked. So yes, you're, you're, um, that's a, um, so if you if you want to follow that up further, uh, I strongly recommend that book, the context of, of ancient drama. Yeah, I hope you can get hold of it. Perfect. Ah, I'll search to make it available for them. <laughs> uh, uh, Mariana, Mariana Ventis has a, another question. Uh, she says, Professor, in a recent conversation about tragedy and plague, oh, yes. you have asked yourself, what is the purpose of the tragedy? The search for tragedy, even in times of plague and suffering, may be linked to some kind of therapeutic side as much on its theoreticality or in, or in yeah. its own described suffering. 
Yeah, no, thank you very much, Mariana. I'm, uh, I'm very impressed that you found that uh, conversation. You mean the conversation I had with, uh, with Fiona Shaw, a wonderful actor. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, conversation about, um, about tragedy and obviously in a time, in a time of plague, uh, as we have, um, because of course in Athens, uh, back in 429, for about four years, from 429 to 425, they suffered a plague far, far worse than ours. Probably killed about 25% of the entire population. So it really makes our, our plague bad though it is, it makes it look much, uh, much less. Um, yes, what I, what I tried to suggest, um, it's not, it's not, um, I think the, the effect of tragedy, what is the effect of tragedy on its audience? Now, the, the brilliant thing in Aristotle's poetics is that Aristotle asks that question. And I think that was a touch of genius. Instead of defining tragedy in some uh, terms of external form or something like that, he says, the essence of tragedy is the effect that it has on its audience. And of course, the effect that Aristotle came up with is catharsis, or perhaps you call it catharsis. People pronounce it different. You know, it's amazing that one use in Aristotle's poetics has, uh, has supplied a word to modern languages. So we call it catharsis. The Germans call it catharsis. In, uh, in Brazilian Portuguese, you call it? Catharsis. Ca what? Catharsis. 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 Sorry, catharsis. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, what I wouldn't want to draw a distinction between the theatricality on the one hand and the therapeutic, if that's the right word, effect of tragedy, the 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 benefit of tragedy on the other, because I think the 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 experience of tragedy, the catharsis or whatever it is, uh, is achieved through the theatricality, because the theatricality is what makes the audience experience the suffering. So what happens where I'm agreeing with, I agree with Aristotle this far, um, that the audience um, experience the suffering and the, not only the, uh, the suffering and the emotions and the thoughts and the dilemmas of the tragedy. And that has an effect on them. And Aristotle says the effect is that it purifies them, that it somehow cleans them. That's what catharsis implies, that it, um, that it somehow enables them to get rid of something unhealthy. Now, I, I, what I was saying in my conversation with uh, Fiona Shaw was I wanted to suggest a different um, medical or therapeutic uh, metaphor. And I got a bit of inspiration here from uh, Schiller, Friedrich Schiller, the, the German uh, poet, who, um, whether or he meant it in our modern sense, I'm not sure, because it's in 1792, I think, said that um, what tragedy does is give its audience an inoculation against the inevitable. Now, I don't know, do you have the word inoculation uh, for a, like a vaccination? Uh, inoculation, you know, it, you have an inoculation that protects you against catching the disease. Um, and, or not against catching it, but it protects you against it. It, it makes it milder, it makes it uh, less deadly. Um, vaccination was actually, the word was invented four years later uh, by Edward Jenner uh, in 1796. <laughs> and, um, uh, um, inoculation actually comes from going in through the eye um, and vaccination of course comes from the cow uh, where um, Jenna um, made the vaccination for smallpox um, so what I wanted to suggest was that what, you, what happens to the audience of tragedy is not that they get rid of something not that they are purified not that they are um, cleansed um, but that they gain something. 
instead of leaving something behind, they take something with them. And so I wanted to suggest that they take with them a, something like an inoculation, something like a vaccination against the inevitable. Well, by I think Schiller meant above all against death. Now, of course, but also against terrible suffering. Tragedy doesn't save us from terrible suffering and, and death. Uh, above all, you know, on the contrary, tragedy makes us all face mortality. But it, it's like a vaccination or an inoc inoculation that lessens, that protects against the worst. So what, I'm, what I was suggesting in the conversation with Fiona was that, um, that, it, that you leave a tragedy stronger. Did you leave a tragedy that the, the, you know, the world is a terrible, uh, the human world is a terrible, chaotic, cacophonous, ugly uh, world on which we, have, we try to impose some meaning. We try to make some sense of it. We try to stop it from being meaningless. Um, and I think tragedy helps us to see, to make some sense of it, to, to, to cope. I don't know if you know the word to cope with, um, to, um, to tolerate. Uh, so that, that was the kind of line I was taking. And I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased. Uh, Mariana, that you you uh, looked at the uh, at the recording of that, um, and that that's the kind of approach that I'm. That's the chapter I haven't yet written. That chapter, in my, what I'm writing at the moment, I've written all about the theatricality of the Oristan, but the very last chapter, which is where I'm reaching, uh, will be about precisely about what does, what is the effect of tragedy? What is the point of watching tragedy what does it does it does it do you any good you know i thought of calling my book which i'm writing uh, is tragedy good for you now i don't think i will call it that but in a way that's the uh, that's the question i'm asking there and that's the question that you've raised thank you yeah yeah good uh we have another question here from yeah. julia uh, again uh she's asking you how can contemporary stage productions of Greek tragedy help us understand or receive the text in an academic context? Yes. Uh, that's a good, that's a, I mean, um, I've had quite a lot to do with theater people in my life. I've been lucky, you know, I've, I've collaborated with quite a lot of uh, productions both uh, amateur productions and professional productions. Um, and as an academic, uh, being a kind of dramaturg, do you, do you have that word in Portuguese, a dramatur dramaturge? Uh, it's not really an English yes. word. It's, uh, <laughs> dramaturg in French and uh, dramaturg in German. Um, and I've, I've enjoyed having that role, but the thing I have learned I must never do is lecture them. I can't tell a modern production to do it this way or to do it that way because that's the way that Aeschylus did it. So the lecture I gave you just now, the, the talk I gave you about theatricality and about stage space and and uh, the work of the skewer poios and the stage properties and all that kind of thing, um, I can't impose those on a modern production. Um, and what I have found that I can do, you know, I, I usually when I've collaborated with productions, I've gone to rehearsals and people ask me questions in rehearsals and I just throw out ideas. And sometimes those ideas um, uh, turn into something in the production. So, I think what what it, what 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 we can't do, uh, what academics can't do, is tell theatre people what to do. Uh, if 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 academics try to tell theatre people what to do, the theatre people say goodbye. <laughs> uh, um, 
you know, you're just a stuffy old pedant academic, um, and um, we are uh, uh, creative uh, professional or creative practitioners in the theatre. But if you feed in material, then it can sometimes help them, inspire them. Let me give you one example. There was a wonderful production of the Orisaya in London now 20 years ago. It, it, uh, uh, it opened in 1999, it was in 1999 to 2000, directed by, directed by Katie Mitchell, who's a, you may have heard of, a very uh, important now international director. And I talked with her a lot and, you know, I went to rehearsals. And we were talking about the purple cloth. But and I was talking about how in the scene where the chorus evoke the sacrifice of Iphigenia at Orlis in the first big choral song of Agamemnon, they say that as they held uh, Iphigenia to um, sacrifice her, her robes fell to the ground. So that's the first time that you get the image of cloth on the ground. And then Katie suddenly said, of course, and this is very much a modern producer's, modern director's uh, approach, of course, Clytemnestra will have kept all her clothes. The mother will have kept her child's clothes. And when the purple cloth was unwrapped in the, the Katie Mitchell production, it was made entirely of little girls' dresses, of little... Uh, bloodstained, stained all purple. It was the most amazing moment. And in my little way, I gave her the idea uh, uh, of doing that. So that, that I think, uh, Julia, that's the way I sort of see the, the kind of what I might call creative interaction between academics and theatre people. Uh, we received another question from a friend from Julia, in, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, who asked, in Coefri, yeah. Clitemnestra asks for, asks for someone to bring an axe to murder a man with. Yes. You mentioned the importance of the sword. Yes. I would like to know what are your thoughts on Clitemnestra's axe and if it was shown in the theater on Agamemnon. Yes, oh, she also and her, her name is her name is Caroline. Yes, uh, okay, <laughs> Caroline. Yes, <laughs> um, um, I think it's pretty clear, insofar as you can trust the text, and of course you've raised that question of how definitive is the text as evidence, that the weapon with which Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon was the sword. And the weapon with which Orestes killed Aegisthus was the sword. And the weapon with which Orestes killed Clytemnestra was the sword. Because in the final scene, when, uh, if you've just been reading the last scene of Coifri, uh, he says, I have a sword in one hand and an olive branch in the other hand. And I'm going to go to, um, the or to, to, go to Delphi to seek the protection of Apollo. So, the stage property that was visible was the sword. But you absolutely, Caroline is quite, or Carolina is quite right that uh, when Clytemnestra realizes that she's been deceived and that she's in danger, she says, Quick, somebody bring me an axe that's good for killing a man. Um, so I don't think the axe, I'm inclined to say the axe was not visible, but that there's something particularly brutal, uh, particularly masculine about the axe. And it may well be that in the previous iconography, you know, if you look at the, 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 the scene of the scene of the killing of Agamemnon and above all the scene, the scene of the killing of Aegisthus, is represented quite a lot in ancient art before, in vase painting and sculpture, before the Oristaya. And very often there's an ax. Um, and it is true that if, uh, I'm just thinking now, Sophocles play Electra, 
Electra says that they killed Agamemnon with an axe. They said like wood choppers chop wood. Um, so an axe is an axe is the, the violence of an axe uh, is very appropriate for Clytemnestra to call for. Uh, but I think that the actual prop, the actual stage property that the Skiopoyos had to supply that was seen on the stage was a sword. <laughs> that, that, that would be uh, uh, the best I could do. But if you were putting on a modern production, you might prefer an axe. <laughs> an axe might seem more, more gruesome. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I have a question uh, too right now. Uh, you, you bring it up, uh, the, the question of the limitation of the number of actors. Oh, yeah. Uh, and in many Greek plays, uh, including Dagamemnon, one actor would represent more than one character. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, like I, I seen, I have seen a lot of readings of Greek tragedies bringing this up, and I want to know, in your opinion, if this, if this has uh, an importance in the play, uh, if the director, if the if Aeschylus himself, yeah. uh, is trying to present something by using the same actors as different characters. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So. Okay. So, so it's um, it's. That's right, uh, that you can, uh, for each play, uh, you can work out uh, which parts each actor probably played. You can't, there are a lot of uncertainties, but you know, you, 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 sometimes you can work it out with a fair degree. Um, for example, if you say um, <clears throat> in the, in the Oristai, the, the, the 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 greatest of the three actors, the, the most um, uh, virtuoso of the three actors must have been Clytemnestra. I mean, Clytemnestra is the most amazing role. Um, and she appears in all three plays. So the person who acted Agamemnon, the person who acted Clytemnestra must have been different from the person who acted Agamemnon. And the person who acted Agamemnon must have been different from the person who acted Cassandra. So there's three roles, uh, Clytemnestra, Agamemnon, Cassandra. The person who acted Aegisthus must have been different from Clytemnestra. Um, and uh, in the third play, the person who acted uh, Orestes and Apollo must be different from the person who acted Clytemnestra because she appears in the third play as a, as a dream. As a kind of ghost. Uh, so you can begin to work these parts out. Now your question is, is it sometimes significant that the same actor plays two different roles? And one that's often cited is, if you know Sophocles' Antigone, Antigone goes to her death and after she is gone, the prophet Tiresias comes on, Tiresias, and people say, well, if Antigone and Tiresias are played by the same person, does that give some significance? I think, personally, I think probably not. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think it was part of the, for what it's worth, this is purely an opinion, um, for what it's worth, the virtuosity of being able to act young woman, Antigone, perhaps age 20, and then to be able to act the old prophet, age 70 and blind, uh, to be able to act those without being obviously the same actor, I think is a great act of virtuosity. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined to think uh, that uh, there's not significance. I mean, if you think to the play you've just been reading, okay, so one actor does Orestes, another actor does Clytemnestra. Now, another actor does Electra, and Electra um, somewhat um, uh, strangely um, never comes back in the second half of the play. So whoever acted Electra must also have acted, well, probably the Aegisthus and the nurse. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Now, I can't see any significance in that. I mean, if you're clever, you can think of a significance, but it's not, but, uh, you know, that because we can always think, you know, if we're clever, we can always find ways of tying things together. But I don't see anything very persuasive. Um, and to say that Electra and Degistus are played by the same actor, I think more illustrates the virtuosity of the actors um, than anything else. But since you've raised the actors and the, the roles, um, I was talking the other day with somebody who works on Shakespeare and the way that Shakespeare created his plays for particular actors. <clears throat> and to some extent, we know enough about his theater to document which actor the major roles were made for, the major male roles were made for, <clears throat> because the female roles in Shakespeare played by, um, by boys. Um, and it's very interesting to look at the personnel of Shakespeare's theatre. Um, now, when Aeschylus came to compose the Oresteia, I think he must have had the most amazing actors. He must have known who he was creating Clytemnestra for, and he must have known who he was creating Cassandra for. Um, and so two of, you know, two of, he knew that two of his actors could be a um, put in amazing performances of women. And I think that's a very interesting, you know, it, it seems to me to be very good evidence that the Greek dramatists like Shakespeare, like Moliere, like Brecht, like Chekhov, and like most of the world's great dramatists uh, created their roles for actors they knew. And I think, you know, I don't, I think people haven't emphasized that enough. So that's one of the things I'm going to try and emphasize that Aeschylus knew his actors and created parts for them. Thank you very much. It was very clarifying and very well, interesting way to you. present the actors. <laughs> uh, do you have time for another question? Or well, yes, but, yeah, but soon I think my supper is, uh, my supper is preparing downstairs so soon i just uh, oh. made my way for my <laughs> for my so, <laughs> just one last question about yeah. rehearsals because yeah. we know that the that the place were rehearsed and we know that sometimes even in different cities i i have read about the uh the uh the rural uh, dionysia and yeah. uh, we know from life that uh, Aeschylus presented in in Sicily in Syracuse. Yeah, and so I wanted to know would the the same uh, skilled boy work in the different rehearsals? Would the same actors go there? We what are our sources to know about this? Yeah, it's yeah. possible for us to know something about yeah. it. But no, it, we are too limited on it. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, we we. We have very little evidence for the precise personnel, um, and what we do know is that for the big festival in Athens, uh, put on in the spring, kind of end of March, something like the end of March, beginning of April, you know, before the weather gets too hot, um, <clears throat> that the Koregos, who is the uh, the rich. Uh, financier and the didaskalos the poet and the members of the chorus were all selected were all uh, um, uh, yeah were selected right back in the uh, autumn of the previous year they had at least six months to prepare and the skewer poyos um i'm glad you've picked him up uh he presumably was, uh, he and his team. Now, I mean, the skewer post must have had assistance. Look, just, just think of the Oristar. You have a chorus of old men. Then you have a chorus of uh, women slaves. Then you have the chorus of the amazing Irenius of the Furies. They were 12 or 15. So 12 or 15 costumes and masks for the old men. 12 or 15 costumes and masks for the uh, women in black of the grave. 12 or 15 masks and costumes for these weird uh, ghoulish uh, subterranean uh, chthonic uh, creatures. Um, huge, huge task. So 
they started working on the production a good six months before. Um, and we know that one of the, the Corregos paid for the chorus to train. So he paid for accommodation, for food, uh, and uh, paid uh, a living for the members of the chorus. Um, to what extent the same people got together year after year, we don't know. But I'm I'm beginning to think that like them, like Shakespeare and Moliere and so on and Brecht uh, and others, um, I'm sure you can think of others, uh, they began to make a team. They began to make a company, a theasos, a, a troupe. Um, and I would be, wouldn't be at all surprised if they worked with the same people again and again, people who they knew were good, people who they knew they could trust. Um, as for when it traveled to, to Syracuse, uh, I'd love to know, but we don't know. We don't know whether the Athenians went and did it or whether uh, Hieron in Syracuse um, uh, got together his own uh, local uh, citizens to perform it. Uh, I'd love to know the answer to that. What we do know is that as the fifth century went on, you, you began to get these um, troops of traveling actors. And the, well, I've been thinking a bit, you know, we, we, we know they existed, but we have very little evidence as usual, too little evidence. Um, they consisted of a protagonistess, a deuteragonistess and a tritagonistess, of three actors of whom by far the most important was the protagonist, the protagonist, yes. They must have had three actors. I think they must have had a fourth person who performed the spoken parts of the chorus. They probably had a musician and they must have had a skewer poyos. <laughs> so the very, the very smallest company of traveling players had, I think, at least five. Um, and they, they will have worked together um, as, a, as, a, as a group. And we have, have a bit of evidence about that. Um, so um, it's one of those things where we, we wish we knew more, but since you've raised it, I think, uh, I think people have, uh, scholars have not seen, have not appreciated the extent to which probably people worked as teams, uh, as groups uh, for year after year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for all your questions. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you in Brazil all this, uh, all this way away. <laughs> it's a great pleasure for us too, Professor. Thank you very, very much for being here to answer all of our questions. Now have a good dinner. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for your have questions. Time. Thank you for your questions. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye bye. I'll be ending the record here. Thank you very much, everyone who was present here. É, eu faço falar em português agora, né? É, muito obrigado a todos que estiveram aqui. É, bom, é, um bom dia a todos. É, nos vemos na sexta-feira, na próxima reunião. E aos que nos acompanharam online, muito obrigado pela sua presença, suas perguntas também. Uma boa tarde a todos. Tiago, João, é, vocês, o, o, o João. É, Tiago, eu queria saber se você pode ficar um instantinho para eu falar uma coisa com você. Eu não sei se já parou a gravação. É, eu estou é, finalizando a gravação agora, nesse exato momento. Tá. Pode finalizar de repente, mas eu acho que esse finzinho até vai ser editado, né? Pra... Sim, sim. Tá. Tchau, povo. Parabéns, Tiago. Tchau, tchau Júlia. Foi sensacional, né? Foda. É, eu não sei bem como encerrar, na verdade, pelo... pelo não tem Facebook, stop né? recording? É porque eu tô pelo... pelo celular. Ah, tá. Então eu, eu te mando como... um áudio por, por WhatsApp, não, não tem problema. Eu vou, eu vou te ligar. Tá. Acabar. Ok? Perfeito. Valeu. Um